doing? Well, it is a pleasure to be here with you guys this morning at Healing Grace Church. Thank you to your pastor for allowing me to speak to you all this morning. What a privilege and an honor it is. It's always good to be with a bunch of radical people who know that it is finished. Because <laughs> you are a rarity, but you're a rarity that's growing. Because <laughs> we are in the midst of the greatest reformation that the church has ever known. Because about 500 years ago, there was one Luther who was burned out on religion, who came to the end of himself and said, there must be a God out there that is love. But we've got a whole generation of Luthers right now who are saying that same thing. And we've got a whole generation of reformers that are awakening in this hour. Man, and what a privilege it is to stand before a group like that this morning. That's what you guys are. That's what you are. You are the sharp end of the spear in Tulsa. <laughs> Don't ever think low about yourselves, guys. God's going to use you to do something crazy beyond your wildest dreams. It's such a privilege to be here with you guys this morning. As, uh, as you were already told, my name is Jeff Turner. This is my beautiful wife, Diana, of nearly 11 years sitting on the front row. <clears throat> we hail from Michigan near the Detroit area. That's what I always say because if I told you where I was actually from, it wouldn't mean anything to you. So I'll say we're from the Detroit area and our three children are not able to be here with us this weekend. But if they cared, they'd send their greetings as well. But they're young, so they probably wouldn't. You know what I'm saying? But, but it's a privilege to be here with you guys this morning. I think God has a word for us and I think he wants to rock our world. So are you... Oh yeah, one other announcement I forgot to make. Jesus is alive from the dead. <laughs> And in saying he's alive from the dead, that means there was a point at which he was dead. But when he died, he wasn't the only one who died because we all died with him. So before I get to that part, why don't I just go ahead and say that Christ died and you died with him. That means you're no longer a sinner. You're no longer Adam. You're a, to you're a completely new creation. And then the other good news is that he's risen from the dead. And he didn't rise by himself, but he brought you with him. <clears throat> Oh, and in case you missed this part, he's not just alive from the dead, but he's ascended and he's seated at his papa's right hand. And guess what? You're there with him too. So maybe it really is finished, huh? <laughs> I think so. All right, guys, let's open up our Bibles this morning to the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 13. Isaiah 29, 13. And my main text this morning is going to be Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 2 through 6. So actually, I can probably read you from Isaiah, and you could go to Ephesians 1 if you'd like. You know, there was a great awakening that swept through America several centuries ago, and it's called the First Great Awakening. And this movement was birthed by the preaching of a man named Jonathan Edwards. And the message that birthed that First Great Awakening, as it's called, was a message called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, a very uplifting, kind of go get them kind of message. One of those messages that after it's preached, you leave feeling like you can take over the world, you leave feeling like a million bucks. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, when people left from that service, they committed suicide. There's at least two reports reported suicides that took place as a result of Jonathan Edwards' famous sermon. One of those was Edwards' own uncle. There's actually a whole period in the Great Awakening called the suicide craze in which men and women felt so broken, so far and so distant from God, so depraved and so hopeless that they actually began taking their lives because they didn't feel like there was any hope in trying to please and appease this God who lived on a cloud somewhere, who was just some judicial monster, who was making a list, checking it twice, trying to find out who's been naughty or nice, and if you can perform well enough, you can get them to like you, and maybe you can get some of that divine lubricant called grace on you, and you can slip through heaven's gates one day. And so men just could not stand the tyranny of this message, and so they literally began taking their lives. Now, not a whole, not, not most of them didn't take their lives physically, but still, a great spiritual death actually crept into the church as a result of that form of preaching, and we're still tasting the bitter fruit of that movement today. Day. We still have that message, that, or the echoes of that message. They're still lingering in, the, in our spirit, this message that we're sinners and that we're in the hands of an angry God. We're nothing but sinners saved by grace. You are not a sinner saved by grace. That might make a great bumper sticker, but it makes horrific theology. You are not a sinner saved by grace. You are God's very own righteousness. <clears throat> and the God you serve is not angry. 
And he's not some judicial monster who's just interested in you having all of your I's dotted and your T's crossed. He's a papa who loves you. <clears throat> There's a great reversal taking place in this hour. Sinners in the hands of an angry God is about to be swallowed up by saints in the arms of a happy God. There's a new generation of Edwards who know what the gospel really is that are rising up in this hour. And man, we're about to see something happen like we've never seen before. Ah. What a privilege it is to be a part of it. Amen? <laughs> All right, are you in Isaiah 29 yet? Okay, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13 says, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and they honor me with their lips, they have removed their hearts from me, and their fear towards me is a commandment taught by men. Let me read that to you again. Therefore the Lord said, inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, they have removed their hearts from me, and their fear towards me is a commandment taught by men. How many of you guys know it's very possible to be polished and proper and look like the apex of what a Christian should be on the outside, but on the inside be absolutely devoid of love for God? And the Bible here is describing a group of people like that, that they have it all together on the outside. They draw God, they draw near to God with their lips and with their external selves. They look like what a Christian should be, but their hearts they have removed from God. There's not a fire burning on the inside of them. They're not really alive. They're going through motions, serving some God, trying to get a bus ticket to heaven one day. They're doing all of the right stuff. They're living moral, decent, and upright lives. They're living, quote-unquote, godly. And how do I know they're living, quote-unquote, godly? Because Jesus tells us in Matthew 15, 7 through 9, that this is a prophecy about the Pharisees. And if anyone had, quote-unquote, righteousness together, it was the Pharisees. I mean, their righteousness had righteousness growing on it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, their law keeping was keeping the law, right? The Pharisees were a group of men that said it's not enough just to keep the law. We got to build fences around the law so that we won't even act so that we won't accidentally break the law. So instead of just not plowing on the Sabbath, you can't even spit on the ground on the Sabbath because your spittle might move the earth and that could be considered plowing. So let's build a fence around this law. And that's why Jesus is spitting on the ground on the Sabbath to heal people. <clears throat> He's like, look, my daddy does not respond to your rules and regulations. So let me do a little plowing on the Sabbath and back it up with some power. Let's see you do the same stuff with your religion. Can't do it? Oh, maybe I got the goods then. Maybe you don't. But this group of Pharisees, they were men. I mean, if, if, if anyone ever earned God's favor through external righteousness, it was them. Yet Jesus tells us that these were people that they drew near to God with their lips. They looked the part, man. They had it all down. But on the inside, there was no fire burning. They weren't in love with him. They weren't lovesick for God. They didn't lay on their beds at night and dream dreams about him. They weren't in love with him. They had unplugged themselves from him. They had removed their hearts from him. Why? And if you're going to remove your heart from him, why keep up the facade? Why even keep going for it? Why keep trying to keep all the rules and regulations if you've unplugged your love from God? Why even keep going? Because it tells us here that their fear towards him was a commandment taught by men. See, they had an image of God that was false. They had an image of God that was wrong. They saw God as some judicial monster, not one who dwells on Mount Zion, but one who dwells on Mount Olympus. He's got a bag full of lightning bolts, and he's going to get you. And that was their image. That was the portrait of God that they had. They saw God through the broken mind of Adam. Their fear of God was a commandment taught by men. And as a result, they kept serving him externally, but they unplugged their love from him. And they were going through the motions, but there was no fire inside of them. How many Christians in America does, does that define right there? We're going through the motions. Man, if anyone ever earned revival through religious activity, it would have been this chap right here. I mean, I prayed more in one week than most Christians pray in their entire lives. And I'm not joking. Eight hours was a light day of prayer for me in concert. I mean, I didn't sleep. I prayed and I went after God. And it's like, why even keep... I kept doing it because I had this image of God that I had to please him. I had to earn his favor. I had to get him to like me. My fear of God was a commandment taught by men, and it kept me going in an external sense, but I had no real burning love for him. <laughs> when Jesus shows up on the scene, he comes to reverse this whole mess. He comes and he says, no one has seen God but me. 
and I've come to reveal him. No one has known God. That means not Isaiah, not Ezekiel, not Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. None of them have really seen him. They've all seen him through the lens of Adam. Yes, they've heard his voice. Yes, they've heard his spirit. But even they did not really know him. But I've existed in his embrace for all of eternity. And I've come to unveil to you who he truly is. And that's what the rending of the veil in the temple really represents. The Bible tells us that the rending, the tearing of the veil represented the tearing of Christ's flesh. It didn't represent God removing some barrier that he erected between the two of us. It represented God revealing who he truly was to us by laying his life down for us. It was a revelation. It was an unveiling of love. Because God could have zapped your sins from the heavens and never told you about it. He could have forgiven you just by a choice. He could have done away with your old Adamic self just by snapping his fingers, but he chose not to do it that way. He chose to unveil and reveal his love to you by becoming a man and having his flesh torn. And in the tearing of his flesh, what was behind the veil was revealed. The real heart and nature of God. Jesus comes to debunk this myth of the angry God that all of us have swallowed hook, line, and sinker at one point in our lives. And I'm telling you something, until we, can, we can rake people over the coals, we can beat them over the head with rules and regulations and damnation and hellfire and brimstone, and we won't change anything. But if we can present to people a God who truly loves them, a God who's really on their side, a God who does not have a dark side that Jesus had to deal with, but a God who's truly into you. <laughs> that's when your heart starts to burn. Ah, that's when something happens inside of you. You guys with me this morning? In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's interesting because we think that's Jesus half the time, don't we? <laughs> he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and that's how he teaches us life lessons, right? <laughs> The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've said it many times, but if the accuser of the brethren showed up in most churches, we'd bow down and say, welcome, Holy Spirit. <laughs> the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. <laughs> Jesus came to introduce you to real life. By introducing you to his father. He came to bring you into something that you did not have before. He came to give you life. And so much life that it could not be contained just within you. But it's abundant. It's spilling out of you. What does that life look like? John 17, 3. Now this is eternal life. Plucking a harp on some fluffy cloud forever in heaven. No, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you have sent. Jesus said, I've come to plug you into real life. And do you want to know what it looks like? It looks like intimately knowing me, and intimately knowing my Papa, and being one with the very Spirit of God. Jesus came to give you life, and life more abundantly, and that life looks like familial intimacy with the Trinity. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. Woo! You guys excited? 1 John 4, 16. The apostle says, And so we know and we rely on the love God has for us. It doesn't say we know and rely on the, on the perfection of our performance. It says we know and we rely on the love God has for us. You know why I know I'm safe and secure? Because I know I've got a daddy who loves me. Period. Give me something deeper. No! There's nothing deeper. I know and rely on the love God has for me. I know I'm not going to fall. I know I'm not going to stumble. I know I'm safe and sound because of the love my daddy has for me. So we know and we rely on the love God has for us. In fact, the apostle says, God is love. And whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Listen to that. God is love. <laughs> John doesn't say God feels love. God doesn't say, or John doesn't say love is an emotion that God experiences from time to time when we hit the high note in worship. We're like, oh, you know, the music stops and oh, the voice is raised and he's like, oh, whoa, I can't hold myself back. I'm going to get him. No, it says God is love. That's how he defines himself. He doesn't feel love for you. He is love. Every expression of love that humans understand, it's an offshoot of who he is. God is love. 
He is love. Now, love, by its very definition, is familial, and it has to be shared. Love cannot exist in isolation, can it? If you were born into a world with no color, no sound, no taste, no flavors, no other human beings, just you, and you had no prior memories of anyone else, it was just you, and you were just in this two-dimensional, flat, white world, you had no concept of there ever being another person, you've never seen anyone, you've never conversed with anyone else, you had no even thoughts or imaginings of anyone else because you didn't have a grid for even thinking about it. In that type of context, would it be possible for you to feel love for anything? No, because love has to be shared in a communal setting. Love cannot exist in a vacuum. Love cannot exist in isolation. Love can only exist in company, right? Now, the Bible says that God is love. It didn't say God became love once we showed up. It said God is love. That means before we ever breathed our first breath, he was love. What does that mean but that God was never alone? Because we think God, we think a three-letter word, but what we need to start thinking of is a three-person company. Because God is not one dude with three letters in his name. It's a family. It's Father, Son, and Spirit. Right? And that God is love. That means that between the members of the Godhead, between the Father, Son, and Spirit, there has existed familial love throughout all of eternity. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Son loves the Spirit. The Spirit loves the Son. The Spirit loves the Father. The Father loves the Spirit. They were and always have been a family. God is not just some blinking being out in the universe like a bug zapper just kind of and one day he gets bored and decides he's going to make somebody. He is love. He always has been love. He's always been a part of a family unit. Now this is important. Because if that's that's the case, that means that God did not make you to scratch his relational itch. Because it was already being scratched. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you get that concept that God is love and he always has been love, that means that God didn't create you to satisfy something in himself. Because he already had family. He already experienced love. They already knew what it was to laugh over the dinner table. They already knew what it was to get together and create and plan and strategize and and arm wrestle and do all the things that families do. The Godhead already knew what that was. So God didn't create you then because he needed someone to scratch his familial itch. See, the way I used to view creation was that God was kind of like Tom Hanks in Castaway. You know, you ever seen the movie? And he's just stranded out there in the galaxy, and one day he finds a little uh, volleyball or something, and he makes himself a little Wilson. He makes himself a little imaginary pal that he's going to call his friend. That's how I kind of used to see creation, that God was lonely, some divine castaway, and one day he decides to make a little guy out of dirt, breathe into his nostrils, and makes a son for himself, and now he's got a little pal. No, God has always existed in the context of love and family. You weren't created to scratch his itch. Let me show you something. You guys with me? 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Now the Bible says that God is love, right? God is the very definition of love. You can't define love outside of God. And 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says this, love or God or the Trinity, because God is the definition of love, His relationship, the Father, Son, and Spirit's relationship with each other is the definition of love. God, or love, is not selfish. That means that love, or God, did not create you for himself. (laughs) Hold on now. He did not create you because he needed someone to scratch his itches. He created you because he's not selfish and he wanted to give. Do you get that? Because if God created you to scratch his itches, then God at his center is selfish. Even though it's not a bad selfishness, still that's living with self in mind. He created me for him because he's lonely and he wants a son. No, 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 no. Love is not selfish and I wasn't created to scratch his itch. I was created so that he could scratch mine. And so that he could give. Ha, ha, ha. To bring me right there, smack dab in the middle of their fellowship with one another. So that I could experience family. 
so that I could experience love. See, we've got far too many Christians who think their purpose on this planet is to scratch God's itches and to make him happy. When all he's concerned with is your happiness. Like, that just sounds like an easy gospel. You got it. (laughs) Now you're starting to get it. (laughs) Like, no, that's just like easy believism, greasy grace. Hey, you're getting it, man. (laughs) What do you want? (laughs) You want hard grace? You want to earn it? Go for it. I've I've been there and done that. Got the scars and the mental damage to prove it. Why do you think I'm so crazy? I'm just kidding. Because I ate out of a dumpster all my life, and then one day I realized I can eat at my daddy's table. That's why I'm so crazy. (laughs) Love is not selfish. God is not selfish. He didn't create you to scratch his itches. He created you so that he could give you what he always had with his family, so that the Father, Son, and Spirit could share what they had with you. There was so much love that existed between the members of the Trinity. They said, we can't contain this anymore just between us. We have to give this to someone else. We have to welcome and invite someone else into this circle because we're not selfish and we can't hoard it. We have to adopt someone into this family so we can give what we experience on a daily basis. And you were created as a result of that decision on the part of the Godhead. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 2 through 6. Ephesians 1, 2 through 6, the Apostle Paul says, May grace and peace be granted to you from, the God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, not who's in the process of blessing us, but who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. Now pause. That's great right there. If we just stopped and took that to me, he's blessed me with every spiritual blessing, so I'm blessed. I got blessings coming out of my ears. I got blessings here. I got blessings there. I got blessings everywhere. I got a river of life flowing out of me. It makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Hallelujah. That's awesome if we stopped right there. But it means something specific when it says we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Because how does it start off? It starts off by saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the context and the setting of this scripture is family. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing which exists in the heavenly realms in Christ. What is that? What is that spiritual blessing? It's the union of the Father and the Son and the Spirit together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who saw fit to bless us with the same spiritual union that they have with each other. He's chosen to bless us with it and give it to us. Now it says he has blessed you with it. It doesn't say he's getting ready to do it. It doesn't say you're getting ready to enter into a season where God's going to do it in your life. Praise the Lord. It says he has done it. Right here, right now, this morning, you're in perfect unity with the Godhead. I don't feel like it. It doesn't matter. You are. Right here, right now, this morning, you're one spirit with God's spirit. I don't feel it. You are. He has blessed you with every spiritual blessing which exists in the heavenly realms in Christ. Now listen, even as in his love, he chose us as his own in Christ before the creation of the world, that we might be holy and without blemish in his presence. And that phrase, holy without blemish, Holy and without blemish in his presence. Your Bible might read, holy and without blemish in his sight. Some people take that to mean that we've just kind of been made judicially or legally holy in God's sight. We've just been given like legal right standing with God, but it doesn't go beyond that. That's not what it means. When it says you've been made holy and without blemish in his sight or in his presence, it literally means God has made you just like him so that you can exist in his very presence. You don't have a legal righteousness. You have a real righteousness. You're not just judicially clean, you're clean. You've been made holy and without blemish in his presence. 
Can I just read this to you? Marcus Barth, the Bible commentator, says this about that portion, that passage. Being made holy and without blemish in his presence. says, before him denotes the immediate presence of God to man and the closest proximity of man to God. The image suggests the position and relationship enjoyed by the cream of society at a royal court, by children to their father, by a bride to their bridegroom. It means you've been made holy just like God so that you can exist comfortably in his presence. Not so that he won't zap you with his divine anger, but so that you can feel comfortable being there. Ah! He chose us as his own in Christ before the creation of the world. He didn't choose you when you got your act together. He chose you before you even had a chance to mess it up. He chose us as his own in Christ before the creation of the world that we might be holy and without blemish in his presence. For he predestined us to be adopted by himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Such being his gracious will and pleasure to the praise of the glorious splendor of his grace with which he has enriched us in the beloved one. See, you were created for one purpose, to be adopted. You weren't created to scratch his itches. He adopted you so that he could scratch yours. Do you get that? God is absolutely unselfish, and he's not in this thing for his own well-being. He's in it for yours. He predestined you before the creation of the world to be a son for your sake. Do you get that? Do you get how revolutionary and paradigm shattering that is? That God created me for my benefit. He brought me into existence for my own good, not for his. He brought me into being so that he could lavish me with love. So that I could be consumed by the fire of his love every day, day and night, night and day, waking up in his presence, going to bed in his presence, driving down the road in his presence, parenting my kids in his presence, being a good husband in his presence, preaching the gospel in his presence, never stops, never stops, never stops, living in ceaseless, unbroken union and fellowship. That's why I was created. Before the creation of the world, Paul tells us, listen man, when you were a kid, did you ever like, your parents were in the room whispering and you kind of pressed your ear up against the door because you wanted to hear what was going on? Paul's kind of taking us back in time here in a little revelatory DeLorean and he's taking us back in time to the very beginning of it all and he's letting us put our ear up against the Trinity's bedroom door and listen in on a conversation they had about us before we ever existed. They're talking about us. Come on now, your name was on the lips of the Trinity before you were ever created. They talked about you. They brought your name up. They mentioned you by name. <laughs> they said, we're bringing them into existence. We're bringing them into being so we can love them. <sighs> we're going to create a race and we're going to call them sons and daughters. We're going to adopt them into our family. We're going to adopt them into our love and our fellowship and we're going to give them what we have. We're going to let them know perfect unity. An unconditional love. See, you give me a God like that, I don't have a hard time burning for him. You give me a God like that, I don't have a hard time keeping my heart plugged into his. You give me a God like that, I don't have, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything, I'll say anything, I'll be anything for a daddy like that. You give me that judicial monster of Jonathan Edwards, and I'm heading for the hills. Come on, no wonder we're apathetic, and I don't mean you, but no wonder the church is. No wonder we're sitting on our hands. No wonder we could care less about the broken and the hurting, because our God doesn't care. He's just aloof up there in the sky, twiddling his thumbs, waiting for judgment day so we can roast him forever. That's our God. But the real God, the real God whom Jesus reveals is a God who mentioned your name before he ever breathed into the dust that became Adam. He said, I want them. This is too much love, just a hoard. We've got to give it. We've got to give it away. I want to create people that I can look them in the eye and tell them there's something. I want to create sons and daughters I can hold their hand and say, you mean so much. You're worth so much to me. And let me tell you something, guys. You in this room, you are worthy. And you're not worthy because of Christ's blood. 
Christ's blood is the proof that you're worthy. The blood of Christ is not what gives you worth. The blood of Christ is what proves your worth. Because such a high price would not have been paid for you if you weren't worth it. Jesus likens you unto a silver coin that a woman lost. Doesn't he? That silver drachma that fell in the dust, did it lose its value when it touched the dust? No, it was still worth what it was worth. And just because we fell into the dust of Adam doesn't mean we lost our worth or our value in God's sight. We're still worth what we were worth to him. And he paid the price he paid for you because he loves you and he saw you as being worth it. You're something. (laughs) You were created for you to experience the love and the beauty of God. I mean, just think about that. My name was on the lips of the Trinity. In creation, somewhere in the universe, they talked about me. Little old me, right here, right now in 2012, they talked about me. That, that millennia later, they would have a son named Jeff Turner. Oh. And they saw all the junk and all the brokenness I'd put myself through. They said, but we're going to capture that young man's heart. We're going to capture his young heart when he's just a 20-year-old punk in Bible school thinking he knows everything. A decade or so ago, we're going to arrest his attention. We're going to woo him with loving kindness. And the same thing was said about you. You were created for your benefit because we serve a God who is unselfish love. Good night, man. Woo! You've been adopted, and that's the reason you exist. 1 Timothy 2.5 says that there is one God and there's one mediator between God and man. Pause before I finish it. There's one God and there's one mediator between God and man. Now how we've taken this is that we're kind of in a boxing ring with God and Jesus is like the referee keeping us from messing each other up too much. God's on one side, we're on the other. He's full of wrath and indignation against us and Jesus is kind of standing in the way, softening the blows. That Jesus is big brother, who when daddy's had one too many glasses of wrath to drink, and he comes stumbling up the stairs, and he's going to put one on junior, big brother comes from across the hall, and he protects us from it. That is not what this means. There is one God, and there's a human race, but there's a point of connection between God and the human race. Who is it? Jesus Christ, but it doesn't just say Jesus Christ, because it says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. Come on now, there's one God, one mediator mediator between God and man, and it's the man, Jesus Christ. Come on, think about this. Very God himself. God who is spirit, John 4, 24, forever takes upon himself a body. A human body. He comes and he takes broken Adamic flesh upon himself and for 33 years he radiates perfection through it. Then after 33 years he destroys that old temple and he puts to death sin that was at work in our members and he brings that human race back up from the grave, an entirely new creation and then after 40 days, guess what he does? He ascends and he goes back to his daddy's right hand and he sits down as a man. Yes, he's still God, 100%, but the Bible, even after the ascension, calls him the man, Jesus Christ. Guess what? That's when you were adopted because he brought your humanity right into his father's presence and he sat it at his father's right hand. That's how you're linked forever to the Trinity because a member of the Trinity is eternally a man now. Think about it. Uncreated God took creation upon himself forever. Why? So that he could be the one mediator between God and men. So he could be the point of connection where we realize God's okay with my humanity. So Jesus could be the, <laughs> Jesus could be the point of connection that tells us, I'm okay with you as you because one of you lives in my presence. <laughs> and not only is it just one of you lives in my presence, you're all in him, in me. 
That's why Ephesians 2, 6 says, He raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus because He was wearing us, and when He ascended to His Father's right hand, He sat down as us, and we are eternally in the Father's presence, eternally a part of the family. That's why it says in John 8, A slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. Listen to me, Christians. Listen to me, sons and daughters of God. Your sonship is secure so long as Christ's sonship is secure. Is Jesus right with God? Yes. So are you because he's wearing you. Is there any separation between him and his father? Then there's none between you and his father. 1 John four seventeen. What he is, so are you in this world. Christ is your life. And that's a life lived in his daddy's presence. Hebrews 2.11 says, both the one who makes men holy, that's him, and the one who made, the one, those who are made holy, that's us, are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. We're part of God's family, and Jesus isn't ashamed to call us his brothers. Literally, part of God's family. Think about it, man. Literally, a part of the family of God. You're a part of the family. You're allowed to share meals with them. You're allowed to share games and laughter and holidays and creativity and joy with them. You're part of the family. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. And Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Come on. Now the Spirit of God has been given to us to prove this reality to us. Because our mind still wants to default back to that Adamic setting and think in opposition to God's thoughts. We no longer have an Adamic mind. We have the mind of Jesus. But we grew up with one. We grew up thinking like a fallen son. We grew up thinking like Adam. And so now that we know we're sons of God, we still tend to think like Adam. And so the Spirit of God is given to us primarily not so that we can work miracles, although thank God we can. The Spirit of God is given to us not just so that we can do signs and wonders, although thank God we can and we should be. The Spirit of God is given to us to prove to us that we are sons like God says we are. Check this out. Galatians 4, 4 through 6 ah, says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under the law. By the way, you're not under the law. <laughs> How many of you are Jews in here? How many of you are Gentiles? I mean, by birth. Then You were never under the law anyways, so <laughs> why would you want to go back under it now? Anyways, we're a messed up bunch, aren't we? <laughs> Born under law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Listen. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. The Bible says because you're already a son, because this has been made real through what Christ accomplished on your behalf, he ascends, he prays the Father, the Father sends the Spirit, you're adopted into the family, and the Spirit is given to you to prove this reality to you. Because you are sons, he has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Spirit lives in you to convince you of the fact that you are a son. That's why you have him. You are already a son. You don't become a son when you receive him. It says because you are a son. He sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. And by him we cry, Daddy. He teaches us to relate to the father the same way that Jesus relates to the father. He has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Wow, that's so different from the Holy Spirit I grew up with. We hit on this last night for a minute or two, but the Holy Spirit I grew up with was the guy who was always nitpicking me about all my shortcomings and my faults and my failures. The Holy Spirit was there to convict me when I got off track. John 16, 8 through 11. You know the verse? It says, when, he, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regards to sin, righteousness, and judgment. Well, it sounds like the Holy Spirit's purpose is to speak to me about sin, my lack of righteousness, and coming judgment if I don't get my act in order. Do you know how absolutely butchered that is? Here's what it actually says. When he comes, he will convict or prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. He will prove them to be wrong about sin 
because people don't believe in me. The world doesn't have a sin problem, they have a son problem, A.B. Simpson said. The sin issue is whether you believe in Jesus or not. And Jesus says, you've got sin all wrong. You think it's do's and don'ts, but when the Spirit comes, he's going to prove to you you're wrong about sin. It doesn't say he's going to speak to you all the time about how bad you are. It says he's going to prove you to be in the wrong about sin, because sin is unbelief in Christ. He'll prove you to be wrong about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer because you think righteousness is you've got to go to the Father and he's going to show you no Jesus went on your behalf. And about judgment because you think judgment is God coming against you but the prince of this world stands condemned already. What it really means is when the Spirit comes he's going to prove to us that we've been wrong on these three three theological points. We think sin is do's and don'ts. We think righteousness is getting to God and we think God's judgment is a big gun that's aimed at us. He says, when the Spirit comes, he's going to show you, no, sin is just about unbelief in Christ. Righteousness is about the fact that I'm going on your behalf, so you don't have to do it. And judgment is not against you, it's against the devil. Moo, hear that sacred cow tip? (laughs) See, look, the Holy Spirit is not in your heart to convict you of how bad you are. The Holy Spirit lives in you to to convince you of your sonship. To convince you of the reality of your adoption. Because you are sons, he has sent the spirit of a son into our hearts. And that spirit testifies to our spirit. You're a son. Call him Abba Father. Talk to him the way I talk to him. It's already true. When the spirit comes, oh, I realize it. John, I'm going to end. I know i got to end. Romans 8, 15 through 16 says, You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. You have received a spirit of adoption as sons, and by him we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our own spirit that we are the children of God. If the Holy Spirit you're listening to is testing, testifying to you about anything other than your sonship and your union with God, question the voice you're listening to. If the voice you think is the Holy Spirit is always talking to you about how bad you are and how short you come up every time, stop listening to his voice. Because the Spirit of God should be testifying to you about your sonship. What about when I fall flat on my face? Yeah, the Holy Spirit's going to say, it's okay, you're still a son. Get up and dust yourself off. Don't identify with this. Get up, you're a son. Have I failed since I've been a believer? Yeah, numerous times. You know how the Lord treats me? He brings me in his lap and hugs me. It's okay, man. I love you. We freak out like we can fall out of grace. Do you have any idea how strong his grip is? Do you have any idea how determined he is to hold on to you? Whew. John 14, 18 through 20, and I'm ending, says Jesus is speaking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. What are orphans? Orphans are children without a family. And Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. And when he says, I will come to you, who's he talking about? talking about the spirit of God right he says I will not leave you as orphans I will come to you before long the world won't be able to see me anymore but you will see me and because I live you also will live and on that day on what day on the day the spirit comes you will realize On that day when the Spirit comes, you will realize that I am in my Father and that you are in me and that I am in you. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you thinking that you're children without a family. I will not leave you just floating throughout the galaxy thinking you're on your own trying to appease and please some deity in the sky. I won't leave things like that. I'm going to come to you. My spirit's coming to you. And when he comes into you, you're going to realize something. That you've already been adopted into the family and you're going to realize that I'm in my father and that you're in me, and I'm in you. You're sealed in tight. On that day, you will realize. See, you don't have to make it happen. You just have to realize that it already did, and you don't even have to realize it on your own. The Holy Spirit's there to help you realize. See, really, you just get to sit down and let God do the whole thing. You're in the family. I want you to know that. You're not excluded. You're not on the outside trying to get in. You're not outside the bakery like some orphan longing over that donut in the window. You're inside. You're part of the family. You're seated at your daddy's table. And he's given you his spirit to make it real to you. Shoo! Do you get that? Come on, man. 
Holy Ghost. Yeah! Yeah! Oh! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Well, <laughs> can I give you one more scripture and I'm done? I promise. The kids are going to get in here and your pastor's going to kick me out of here. All right. Ah, oh, this is good news, isn't it? Sheesh. I don't understand Christians and they're like, your love never fails. Never gives up. I don't get you, man. You are bizarre. You're strange. You're weird. I don't get you. Do you know what we're talking about? A son forever. Good night. Did you hear what Jesus says? Because I live, you also will live? Is Jesus under any threat of death? That means you're alive forever with him. George MacDonald once said, as long as the son loves the father with all the love he has, then all is well with the little ones. <laughs> as long as Jesus is in perfect relationship with the father, so are you. He's made it that way. He's made it that easy. And the Holy Spirit's there just telling you about it, re reminding you of it. Whoa! <laughs> trying to contain myself, trying to be a good boy. I'll leave you with this last scripture. Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Oh no, Ezekiel, old covenant, watch out. This is actually a good one. It's a good one. Ezekiel 2, 1 through 2. <laughs> the Lord says to Ezekiel, Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. God wants to commune with you in the context of family. God wants to speak to you in the context of family. He does not want to speak to you when you're like this. He doesn't want to speak to you when you're laying on your face like you're, laying, like you're, like you're lying prostrate before some, before some Roman dictator. He says, son of man, stand up on your feet and then I will speak to you. God wants to commune with you in the context of family, not in the context of tyrannical religion. And as he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. You hear that? Stand on your feet and I'll talk to you. I can't. <laughs> On my own. So the spirit comes, raises him to his feet, and then he begins to experience that communion. See, the spirit of God is given to you to raise you up, say, get off the floor. You're not an orphan. You're not an animal. You're not a dog. Stand up. Look me in the eye, son. Sit at the table with me. Hold hands with me. Fellowship with me like you're worth something because you are. And the spirit of God is in you to empower you to do that. Can you believe that this morning? You are sons and daughters of God. You are in the family. I'm not more in than you, and you're not more in than me. You can't get more in than in. You're in. Jesus is wearing your flesh, and you're filled with his spirit. He's the mediator between God and man. We're stuck, and because he lives, we also live. We are in. We're not excluded. We're in. We're in. We're in. We're in. We're in. And that is good news. Would you stand on your feet? I'm going to turn this over, but guys, would you just raise your hands to the Lord, and can we just give him a shout from our gut, just that we agree with this, and just thank him, yeah, <laughs> woo, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Father, every one of
in this room with an orphan mentality, I break that off them this morning in Jesus' name. By the Spirit, I break that orphan mentality off of every heart and off of every mind this morning. I break that obsessive, compulsive, trying to please God, trying to make Him happy mindset. I break it off you in Jesus' name. I set you free from that right now in Jesus' name. Be free. Be free as a son. Be free to live in love with your daddy. You're a son, not a slave. You are holy. You are righteous. You are accepted. You know, a few years back, I was praying, and I stood before the Lord, and I said, oh, I raised my hands, and I said, holy, holy, holy. And I saw the Lord point his finger right back at me, and he said, holy, holy, holy. And we might want to argue and say, no, you don't understand. Holy, holy, holy. And he's like, you don't understand. Holy, holy, holy. You're in this morning, guys. And don't let the accuser, dressed up in his line of the tribe of Judah outfit, come to you and roar in your face and try and convince you he's Jesus. Don't let that pseudo Holy Spirit that we listen to sometimes comes to us and tells us, you're not really a son. You're not as much of a son as the guy on your left. You're not as much of a son as the guy on your right because you did this. You struggle with this. You stumble in this area all the time. You must not really be a son. If you really are the son of God, Jesus, then why are you even, des even desiring to eat right now? Why are you even tempted by what I'm tempting you with? I think that was the secret message behind Satan's temptations. He comes to Jesus and he's like, if you really are a son, and then he tempts him. And I think the secret logic behind it was, why are you even tempted with this if you're really the son of God? And there's some of you this morning, you're struggling with stuff, you've got issues going on in your life, and you're questioning, if I'm really, why do I even think this way if I'm a son? Why do these thoughts even go through my mind if I'm a son? Your thoughts have nothing to do with your sonship. My son, it doesn't matter what he does, he's my son. My daughters, it doesn't matter what they do, they're my daughters. They can run from me as far as their little feet can carry them, and I will pursue them. And I'll die in the process if need be. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? A God who said, I will pursue you, and I'll die in the process if need be. You're not pursuing God. He's been pursuing you. You're in, guys. And that's the good news to you this morning. Thank you. God bless you guys.